Good afternoon everybody and welcome to another episode. Today I'm going to be talking about the living story, the continuation of it and we're going to just quickly sum up exactly what has changed for the February patch because I detailed the January patch and as long as this stays interesting and I really keep putting good stuff in then I will continue to tell you guys whether it's actually worth to come in game and play it. At the moment I think probably yeah it is. Uh, it's getting pretty interesting. This month to sum it up really briefly there are two new achievements. And there's like a new city type thing, like a massive looking non-settlement city thing, which is crazy, which uh, we'll get to when we get to. So uh, yeah, um, first of all, I'll open it up, just explain again very briefly exactly what the living story is in case you don't know. The living story is ArenaNet's idea that they can extend the Guild Wars 2 story, basically, through small incremental updates. Basically, after every month, you know, they're doing like a big patch every month, um, that each one of those is coming with a big big change to the Guild Wars world in namely two areas, Deus Plateau and the Wayfarer Foothills where a lot of this content is taking place and mostly every Monday as well there seems to be some small change or some small reflection, some small evolution of Tyria. The idea is to make it feel like it's a real living world and that things can be changing, that you can log in each week and something will be different. I think if they ramp up the content that they're putting in just a little bit more that's going to be really cool and that's a cool concept as well like a like a kind of an episodic thing every week you turn it on you go back into Guild Wars 2 once a week and you kind of get to enjoy this little continuation of the plot like an, another episode in the season that is currently the Flame and Frost so um, last month on Flame on Frost uh, last month we had just one achievement uh, if you didn't see I did a video on it all the specific stuff but mostly it was one large achievement we could get by helping out some new refugees that were pouring in from the north in both Wayfarer Foothills and Diasa Plateau they seemed to be running from something we didn't know what at the time but there were small hints that it could have something to do with both the Dredge and the Flame Legion but there was no confirmation on that. Uh, anyway, the month rolled on. There were lots of little changes, little quirks, and interesting things about how the story could go. And now we have this month, where two more achievements have been added. And it's also confirmed now. It's 100% the, the Dredge and the Flame Legion are in an alliance. And I had a few people that were saying to me like on the channel, Oh, this is really boring. What a boring pairing. I, I quite like it, honestly. I think the only way that this game can continue to be interesting with its lore and stuff is to combine those small you know, things that you would never really expect to come together, like the Dredge and the Flame Legion. I'm really excited to see how those forces can combine. ArenaNet's got the ball. We just have to see how far they can run with it. I'm not 100% sure how deep the plot in particular can go with the living story. I don't know whether ArenaNet are focusing this to just be kind of more activities for players to do on a week to week basis or actually try and deliver to us a really interesting compelling story. They have said a few things on the forums recently about how some of the villains that are coming up in the game are supposed to be like really personal villains to you and that's an interesting idea as well. If they can pull that off and make us like personally really detest one of the main villains of this story that could be interesting. But so far we with this patch we haven't seen those villains come into play I'll, I'll, I'll get to that anyway so first of all um, to continue on from last month we had two camps appeared one was in the Black Citadel and one was in Holbrack those camps have changed ever so slightly now there's an extra NPC in both of them who will give you a little bit more information and also the coordinators the refugee coordinators their dialogue has been updated again there are their dialogue has been updated a lot of times like it keeps changing at the moment it is now telling us that uh, in addition to 100% confirmation it's the dredge and flame legion in an alliance, which I'm probably going to say a few times in this video, uh, they also say to us that some of the refugees like have started overflowing basically and some of them have made their way to Lion's Arch. So there have been changes in Lion's Arch, not too much change in the Black Citadel or Holbrek, but there is Lion's Arch included as well now. I'll talk about that in a second because it's got a lot to do with one specific achievement. As for the maps, Diasa Plateau and Wayfarer, all that old stuff from the first month and the original achievement, it's all still there. You can still get that, guys. 100%. It, there's no problem with that. Arena don't want to leave it there and keep it accessible. So you can still play this full story going forward. Um, but in addition to that, there have been some new events added. And we can, for sure, now see the Dredge and Flame Legion fighting alongside one another. Like, loads of Flame Legion will start climbing out of Dredge APCs. And you have Dredge 
climbing out of uh, Flame Legion portals from wherever their headquarters are and stuff. So it, it's quite cool. We get to see that and you get to participate in those events. And indeed, one of the two new achievements um, is simply to kill these new mobs that have been added to the game in these new events. They roll around very quickly. I would suggest you just find a certain area, say around Metoberfest, where you know a lot of those events are going to pop up and just keep sort of circling around, completing the events, waiting for the next APC to appear, complete it again. It shouldn't take too long, 150 mobs. I've actually not done it yet myself. I held off um, doing any of them until I actually started filming and I killed maybe 60 in like 10 minutes or something while I was filming the video so it's really not much of a problem there are a couple of different types of events one where enemies come out of APCs one where enemies come out of flame legion portals and you have to either break the APC or the portal and there's a third type of event too in two specific locations one in Wayfarer and one in the Diasa Plateau you can actually see these new mobs attacking and burning down real areas in the world like they'll take over a ranch in Diasa Plateau a ranch that existed before the living story even began it was even a thing and that's really Really exciting to me I like that because it shows how the living story these new events and developments in Tyria are having a real impact on the world and that's the kind of key stuff I think having this new content interact with the old content is really fun it's actually quite cool to see that so there's those as well they're your bog standard kill all the enemies and the giant ring events and then it will turn blue and then you survive for a little while and voila you've recaptured the area um, so the events themselves mechanically not too interesting but they'll help you get this new achievement and aside from this weird town thing which again I'll talk about later. That's all that's really changed in those areas. Those maps have just had those new events uh, thrown into them. And also, do you remember I was talking about a bodyguard who was supposed to defend a merchant and you could find the merchant's body? Well, that bodyguard that was talking about having a roaring trade and stuff has now been removed from the game, which is weird. I don't know whether that means ArenaNet uh, are trying to make him look more suspicious now or whether it was just kind of something they didn't want to have in there at all and they wish people would stop talking about it. I don't know. So he's been removed. The body of the guy is still there, though, and a lot of the other stuff is still there. Uh, um, otherwise, everything is pretty much intact. Now, the other achievement you can now get is called Lost and Found, and you can't actually complete the achievement yet. You can start progressing in it, and you can start getting achievement points out of it, but you can't finish the whole thing. You see, to complete the achievement, you have to find lost items in Diasa Plateau or Wayfarer Foothills and return them to refugees in Lion's Arch. Uh, and there are six items in total to complete the achievement, but only two can be found in game. It's not like one of those things where you collect like 20 items and then go and hand them in. It's literally you find the item, just the one item, give it to the guy and then it's done and you can't get any more and stuff. So it, it's really a permanent thing and there are only two items in the game right now, but there are going to be six in total. I don't know whether when the next chapter comes out they're going to remove the items that are currently in so you can only get the achievement if you've been actively participating in the living story the whole time. I'm not sure that. It seems a bit dickish and considering they've still left everything open right now I'm pretty sure they wouldn't do that but anyway so if you go to Lion's Arch uh, you can actually find one of those orange stars again on your map in the bottom right hand corner uh, at what I believe was originally just a, a Grawl refugee camp. I believe it was just a Grawl place, but now there's tons of refugees there that have been taken in by, drumroll, the consortium. So these were the guys behind all of the mess that went down during the Karka event. One of the members of the consortium, uh, or ex-members of the consortium, kind of created that whole situation. And a lot of players now, if you've not been keeping up with the story, kind of are very suspicious of the consortium. Don't see them as very good guys, but here the consortium seem to be very nice. They're giving them food and water and taking them in and letting them know that the consortium has their best interests at heart for them. I don't know whether they're just shoveling them crap right now I guess that will be something that is explained in the living story going forward but it does look a bit suspicious what looks even more suspicious perhaps is that the consortium are planning on moving the refugees you can find in Lion's Arch uh, to South Sun Cove which is a cool idea I think because nobody wants to go to South Sun Cove in game anymore so we might see this whole living story and now eventually expand into South Sun but that's what the consortium would like to do they'd like to take these new refugees you can speak to one of the guards there who's looking over the place and she'll happily describe to you about how the consortium wants to relocate them there and I guess somehow make a 
a profit from them and kind of boost their tourism trade as they supposedly are in. So that's what's going on with the consortium. You can speak to a lot of the NPCs. They all tell you pretty good stories about what's going on with them. Uh, mainly the Grawl are very cool though. If you go to the Grawl at the back, they'll say, oh, we were here first. Everybody else is appearing. They need to get away or they need to at least keep some distance. We refuse to move. And the Grawl openly say to you that they really don't like the consortium as well. Like the Grawl don't trust them either, which I think is awesome. I think that's so cool. Like they, they come out this really nice line about how the consortium smiles don't reach their eyes something along those lines which is really cool so this could then be hinting that the Grawl have got some say in the story as we go forward or it could just be a nice little nod to them I, I i always quite like it when npc races are kind of allied with us and we get to talk to them that's always been something really cool about lion's arch if you ask me like you get the the ogres or the etins up in that cave in the top right as well which you, it kind of gives you the same feeling it's just nice to be able to chat with some Grawl. anyway they're a bit disgruntled about the refugee camp but it seems like it's not going to be a permanent thing anyway because everybody's going to be going to South Sun. Uh, so two of the refugees you can speak to there will talk about how they've lost something. One's a Norn, it's this big Norn guy and he misses, like, he's lost his goblet, his drinking goblet. And another one is a Char Cub, actually, uh, who was taken away from her Farrar, basically. I think it's a girl. I don't know whether you can tell for Char Cubs. But this Char Cub has lost his or her, like, wooden toy soldier. And they don't outright ask you to go and find the item that they've lost. They just kind of mention that they've lost something. And then it's up to you as the player to perhaps go to either Wayfarer or uh, the Diasa Plateau and see whether you can find these things. Now... There's no set location for where these items appear. You can find them, they're out in those zones, but I believe it's randomised for each server. So, And it might change as well after patches, a bit like ore. Uh, people have documented the locations that these things might appear, so you could, in theory, walk around all those locations and try and find it. It might take you a while, though. Um, they're quite well hidden. Make sure you're holding down like your control key or whatever so that you can actually highlight any items that are on the floor, and hopefully you'll be able to find the item. I, I, I really really like this mechanic. I think this is the kind of thing that people might complain about and say, oh, it's too vague, it's too difficult to find, this is annoying, because there's no clear guide that will say, oh, your item is here, because it, it changes all the time, or it's different depending on what server. But I really like it, because what you have is last month when the Living Story began, everybody was really excited about it and ran out into Diasa Plateau and the Wayfarer Foothills. And those places were bursting with people it felt like launch it was really fun and there was a big community there was a lot of people going around there and now with this patch again we got the same kind of thing except it was much more cooperative because everyone together on your server is out there looking for that item so if you're watching this video right now and thinking i do want to go and do some living story stuff you'll probably end up logging in game and asking out there in map chat hey does anybody know where it is and that's fantastic if you ask me i think Guild Wars 2 has always been a game where it's a massively multiplayer online game, but so many of their design philosophies have led it to feel like you're just playing alongside people, not really with them, and you rarely acknowledge that other people are about. But for this, that changes it. You know, it really brings that MMO aspect back into this game we're playing, and I, I very much enjoy that. I like seeing that people cooperate like that and trying to hunt these things down, and I, I just generally think it's really cool. It's a little bit frustrating, of course, if, if you just want to get in and out really quickly, but uh, I quite like it. And for the record, it took me about five minutes to find my things without even asking in map chat. So take it or leave it, whether you think it's been uh, a good design choice. But I really like it. Anyway, you can find these items. You can only pick them up once. You can't get them again. You can't trade them to anyone. And you can just take them literally back to those NPCs and it will unlock a little bit more dialogue with them. It will give you progress on your achievement track and you're basically done. It's very traditional questy. It's really nice. I quite like it. It's very much this is a quest giver, but it's done very discreetly. This is your quest item, but it's done very discreetly and in a very fun way. I very much like it. In fact, that exact format of a task or something to complete content to do for players. I think that exact format would work perfectly just littered all over the place in all of the main cities for the game. Like, just add a title, I helped out in Ratasoom, you can call it that, whatever, and then just add loads of NPCs with all this different stuff like that to do. You know, just running around collecting stuff, searching in all the different crevices, because the, these cities are so well designed, they've got so much detail there that people are always just missing. And it's great to see that ArenaNet are incorporating stuff like that into the game. Anyway, that's about that for Lion's Arch. That will get you your two points for this new achievement, which we can't complete just yet. And on the surface, that might seem like you're done with this chapter, you know, for this month, which might not look like that much, really. And I don't think it is that much. I think ArenaNet 2 are hoping to 
up the ante for the amount of content they're putting in. I believe there was uh, a message that essentially what we're seeing each month right now, ideally Arena Network would like to have coming out on a weekly basis, which I think would be fantastic and would really tie into this kind of episodic idea of logging into Guild Wars 2 each week and seeing what new stuff there is to do. It's just enough. Anyway, aside from the achievements, you know, the really basic stuff that people who just grind for rewards want, there is, as ever, other things that have changed. Namely, this big city thing. Up in the north of Wayfarer Foothills, near where one of the other refugee camps was that we saw appear, there's now like a, a huge structure, monastery, sanctuary, town, settlement thing. Uh, it's all walled off and not only has it got these massive wooden walls around it, it's also like completely sealed by invisible barriers. So there's no way any players are getting anywhere near it. There's no infiltrators, arrow shenanigans to get through and see what's going on there. You can't make it. At least I haven't seen anybody manage to break their way through. Um, and at first you might not be able to see much, except that it's the entrance to this huge place that's just kind of appeared. Uh, I don't know whether ArenaNet are going to ask us to believe it all always been there as you know it's big and grand enough to look like it couldn't have just been built by refugees recently or whether they want us to accept that refugees did just build it. Uh, its location is pretty interesting it's on a mountain ridge to the north where previously we saw all those steam vents start appearing so now like that landscape when you were to look north it, it looks totally different from how it did before the living story even began with Guild Wars it really does you know you've got this big kind of city town thing with all of these big flaming braziers there and then these big steam vents too it looks really intimidating and cool clearly we're going to have something going on there by the end of the living story content some people have managed to look uh, quite deep inside it from like getting really far away and looking over the walls and you can see lots of wolf statues up there too. I don't know whether it's a specific place where the Norn go to revere, revere wolf or whether any of the lore is going to get that detailed. It looks a bit to me like it's just filler stuff in there right now but eventually those gates will open and that's a really exciting thought to me. You can see the big intimidating gates right now. There's two of them, one behind the other and finally eventually we'll be able to go up this massive ramp and I'm really looking forward to that because it's it's kind of the first hint of adding a real new place to go and especially one on such a, a large scale if it becomes like a real settlement I would use the term outpost like in Guild Wars 1 it's like having a new outpost added to the game but obviously it's a very different game in Guild Wars 2 and that the term doesn't translate but if this does become a, a large hub of activity for future living story stuff I think that'd be very cool or maybe kind of an end dungeon when the living story finally wraps up we'll have to see what happens some people are speculating on something small that I I'll tell you about it because I think it's cool but I'll tell you at the same time I don't believe it um, on the gates you can see kind of a bird an avian face on the gates and of course people then jump to the Tengu uh, they're an exciting race and I would like it if the Tengu had some part in this living story but on Honestly, guys, the Tengu, despite the fact they're cool, then they don't have any ties to that region of the world. They don't have any law that's pointing them to the Flame Legion or the Dredge or necessarily even the Norn, let alone that area of the world. So I can't see that the Tengu will be a part of this story. We might find the odd lone Tengu that's just out on an adventure that becomes a part of the story. But beyond that, I don't think they'll become a significant aspect. I think it's more likely just kind of a placeholder image on the gate, this weird bird thing. And it could even be a reference to the Raven Spirit, considering that we're dealing with Norn here. I also find it kind of curious that we've got this big settlement here for the Norn, but there has no, been no parallel change in Diessa. Usually when something's changed in one of these areas, there's kind of been a mirror change in the other one, but not this time. There's just the, the Norn one, and that's about it. It could mean, though, that we're about to see a big char fortification appear in Diessa next month. Or maybe this will just be the one, which would be good enough for me. I think one is plenty from what Arena have done so far. One other little small thing as well, if you are considering doing this, when you first log in now, you'll notice that um, depending on your race, the uh, kind of main character of that race will have sent you a mail. So if you are an Asura, you'll get a mail from Zodja. If you are a Silvari, you'll get a mail from Kaith. Uh, and they all basically just tell you to go to this region of the world to participate in the new content. But they do come out with some interesting stuff as well. Kaith in particular talks about how she has to deal with the Nightmare Courts. No idea what's going on there. Why Why does she have to deal with the Nightmare Court? And Zodja is talking about some weird uh, associate of hers that she doesn't want anything to do with, but apparently she does seem to have something to do with. So that's quite interesting. And through all of their mails as well, you kind of 
you get a little bit more of the story of Destiny's Edge post Guild Wars 2, which is always nice to see, and a nice little bit of flavour there. You know, you can hear them kind of jabbing at each other with their words, which is uh, which is always a nice touch. And I like that ArenaNet did that. They could have just sent out one generic mail to everyone, but no, in fact, they're, they're coming from these characters we already know, and who also could be a part of the story, particularly Ritlock and Air. Um, you know, these characters are of the races that are most affected right now, so I'd expect them to stand forward at some point, maybe. Anyway, speaking of going forward, I just want to wrap the video up with this. ArenaNet recently put out on their main website a kind of a prelude for the March update. So this is the February one I'm talking about, but they've actually put out some flavor text on the next one. This is Flame and Frost the Raising. And this is the third of four parts, of course, so we're kind of halfway through if you think about it, which doesn't seem like much content, but they have already referred to the January and February stuff we've already seen as basically just being teaser stuff as they ramp up uh, for the real living story as it goes forward. So hopefully we can take their words on that. Uh, but yeah, March is Flame and Frost the Raising, and we have this little bit of uh, flavor text to kick us off with. Uh, it reads, A hybrid army erupts through fiery portals in the Shiver Peaks. A molten alliance between the Dredge and the Char Flame Legion has created a force powerful enough to massacre any who stand in their way. One settlement, one homestead at a time, they're wiping out all resistance. The Raising has begun. Uh, in Flame and Frost, The Raising, you'll meet the Norn Braham and Rox the Char, two Tyrians who fervently believe in doing what's right, no matter the risk. Join Braham and Rox in a desperate battle to defend their homeland from annihilation in the third instalment in this four-part series. Um, so yeah, we can speculate a little bit on that. Not too much. I like the idea of the Dredge and Flame Legion really coming together and creating something new. Right now, they just seem to be fighting alongside one another and adopting each other's technologies, which is cool and all, but it'll be cool to see them actually kind of combine, which is what it sounds like they're doing here. Um, I kind of picture this large force to be some kind of effigy, like a, a sonic gun-wielding effigy, maybe, from the Flame Legion. Something along those lines. I think that'd be pretty cool. Like, uh, an effigy mining suit maybe i don't know we'll see what happens so they're going to develop something though and start really destroying uh things that are in their way hopefully that means we'll find more of this new content as i said before interacting with old content because i think that's what's what really makes this stuff shine we've also got the this talk of these two new allies two real characters that are going to step forward because right now we've just got lots of npcs really but no characters well here we seem to get one from each race who are they? We don't really know. I think some people are speculating that the Norn could be an orphan that we heard about back in the January update, which I think could be really cool if they do start tying that together. Or they could be someone completely new. I don't really have too much to say on that. Uh, but also on the forums, the devs did say that there are going to be two villains. I believe it's two. Two kind of prominent villains as well that are going to be coming forward. And I guess one of them is going to be Dredge and one of them is going to be Flame Legion. Uh, and yeah, they said that one of them is going to be very, have like a very personal connection to you, which would be interesting and hopefully if they, they really mean that then we'll actually get some deep significant story here that makes this look a lot more like the continuation of the Guild Wars 2 personal story rather than just something totally different that's just adding a bit of extra flavor content to the game uh, so that could be quite good I don't know what do you guys think do you think um, the living story is doing it for you now or are you still just looking to the future I honestly still find myself looking to the future with it it's nice interesting little things for now but it's not very significant it's not really really got me totally invested just yet but I think it could become something really great something like this to keep us going while we wait for large expansions I think would be perfect they just need to push some more out the door and a little bit quicker that's just my opinion though I would like to know what you guys are thinking of the living story have you got any other speculations maybe I didn't come out with and if, hopefully eventually we will get into that settlement anyway thank you very much guys uh, for watching and I will see you next time for maybe an elementalist build or a utility belt I'm not sure one or the other anyway thanks guys and I'll catch you next time.